Excellent. So very nice to see you all again. Huh? So many familiar faces. Huh? Nice to see the two. You both Bikinis, right? Huh? I last asked you before. You both Bikinis? Huh? Huh? Are you both Biku? Bikuni? Yes. Bikuni. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's well. I, I just need to check again because I, my memory, my memory getting bad now, getting old, so my memory fading away. <laughs> Makes it very really hard. Yeah. So uh, it's always nice to see so many familiar faces because it means you're coming back every year, it means you are kind of on the same path, yeah. And the Buddhist path is such that it takes a long time to get really good results from this practice. It's always nice to see people coming back. It means that you're kind of heading in the right direction, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, and I have been a monk for, what is it, 25 years? Something like that. Uh, so uh, it's quite a, quite a while. But, uh, so that's also a kind of a good sign because it means that you are uh, kind of heading in the right direction. Uh, that's great. Uh, so uh, uh, this retreat is going to be very similar to the retreats I've had in previous years. Uh, how many people are new here? Who, who is here for the first time? Yeah, okay, I don't recognize you. You, you, you as well? Okay, you uh, over there. Okay, okay, good. Welcome. Uh, so this is going to be one of the I'm disciple of Ajahn Brahm. You heard of Ajahn Brahm? Yeah, everyone's heard of Ajahn Brahm. It's just very hard to find anyone in the Buddhist community who hasn't. Uh, so because Ajahn Brahm is my teacher, I tend to teach just like Ajahn Brahm. I'm like a clone, clone of Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, <laughs> like identical DNA, absolutely the same, the same thing. So. So the idea, and this is the way Ajahn Brahm has always taught the Buddhist path of meditation practice, is to relax, to enjoy, to have a good time when we're doing meditation. This is kind of the, uh, if you like, one of the root principles uh, of what Buddhism is all about. And if you think about the Buddhist teachings, uh, it's all about, often about dukkha, dukkha being suffering. Yeah. And of course, the reason why we want to talk about dukkha is that's how we can discover the opposite. Uh, the opposite of dukkha is sukkha. Sukkha is happiness. Uh, that's kind of the point of it. Yeah? It's, it's kind of the purpose. So if we create too much suffering in the meditation practice, uh, already we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah? So uh, this is good news for you in case you thought this was going to be some hardcore torture retreat. Uh, it's not going to be hardcore torture. It's going to be very gentle and, and soft and, and nice, hopefully. Yeah? That's kind of the theory anyway, the practice, you never know what's going to happen. But that's the kind of the theory behind this. So, so the idea of these uh, retreats is uh, to combine uh, the suttas, and suttas are the discourses of the Buddha, uh, yeah, the Buddha's teachings, and uh, combine that with meditation practice. Uh, and uh, this is very helpful in many ways. It is helpful because if you read the suttas in the right way, uh, one of the things I want to try to get out of the suttas is how inspiring they can be, and yeah, how not only inspiring but informative, and how uh, how uplifting they can be. And when you read do read something or study something uplifting, yeah, it actually enables the meditation practice. Uh, this is kind of the point. If you feel inspired, you feel uplifted, uh, that is when meditation starts to happen. Uh, and then when meditation starts to happen, uh, and you read the suttas again, uh, then the suttas are more meaningful uh, because your mind is more peaceful uh, and you have more clarity about what is going on. Uh, and then when you so let them read the suttas more deeply, and then that inspires you even more, and then you meditate even better. It kind of has this cascading effect. Uh, Again, that's the theory. The practice is, is always different. You know, it never works out exactly as it does in, uh, in theory. That's kind of how it's supposed to work. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and so the, this is kind of the uh, idea. So we'll see how things go. Uh, and uh, there is a schedule, as you would have seen. And this schedule, I always say, is a schedule that you can use to your own benefit. So just feel what feels right for you and don't feel obliged to do anything in particular. Yeah? If you hate my talks, don't come to my talks. So just stay back in your room or whatever. It's okay. Yeah? We're all different. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to like my talks. There's no obligation at all. Uh, and uh, you're very really welcome just to relax a bit extra and do whatever you, whatever you like. Yeah? So uh, use the schedule as a guideline. Don't use it as a straight jacket that you have to follow this, you know, this, this regime or whatever, uh, and then you will be on the right track. Yeah. There's a few things I uh, would recommend you, however, and that is to keep at the, I don't know about the eight recess, but uh, here somewhere, you, you could have lunch after midday anyway, uh, so if you want to eat a little bit in the afternoon, I'm not going to, I don't really, I, I don't really care, but if you want to keep the eight recess, it can be very useful and very supportive for the practice. Uh, so if lunch is up to two o'clock, then it's like seven and then, Three quarters precept, yeah. 
Very much seven three quarters before it is <laughs> seven point eight three seven. So, so you keep we keep you know you do what you can. I'm going to eat before midday because this is one of my monastic rules, uh, and I'm sure the bhikkhus are going to do the same. Yeah. So we will do that, but for you, it can be more flexible. I, I don't believe in incredible strictness. You do whatever works for people. Right? But try to keep them, because the idea of these things is to actually improve your meditation practice. Right? And there's two things that improves your meditation practice. One is the fact that you live morally. The precepts are about morality. I'm going to talk much more about this later on, because the very foundation of the spiritual path is morality. Without morality, nothing works. The other whole thing just collapses. So, so morality is so important. And the other part of the spiritual part is restraint. Yeah, some degree of restraint in the area of the five senses. Because if you are too interested in the five senses and all the objects of the world, the food, the entertainment, or whatever, it means your mind goes out into that world interest in that world. But he would try to do the opposite. We're trying to bring the mind inside. So too much interest in the external world stops you from being able to withdraw inside of yourself and then develop the mind instead. So this is why we keep these precepts. And this is also why uh, I would recommend you, if you can, to keep what you call noble silence. Uh, yeah, try not to talk too much. Uh, and uh, because I, talking just agitates the mind. Uh, and you will notice that sometimes you just want to talk, and the reason why you want to talk is because the mind is already kind of running very fast. So by not talking, you're allowing, giving the mind a chance to calm down and to be more peaceful. If you keep on talking, you're just encouraging yourself to keep on thinking, it never comes to an end in that way. So if you can be, have that noble silence, especially if you start enjoying it, yeah? One of the problems is that if you're noble silent but you don't enjoy it, it becomes problematic because it becomes like a very tense and unpleasant. So try to enjoy it. Think of it as something positive. Think of it as a gift that you give to your other meditators here. Yeah, I'm going to give you the gift of silence. And everyone can calm down. Everyone can feel more at ease. It becomes even more beautiful as a consequence. So the idea of generosity, of course, a very important part of Buddhism. And one way of being generous is to be quiet so everyone else can enjoy the quiet. Uh, and then it's just another way of looking at the idea of generosity. Yeah. So uh, that is my encouragement. What you ultimately do is entirely up to you. you know, I'm not going to judge you if you don't do these things. And just kind of, that's not the way Buddhism is supposed to work. Yeah. So do whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Just an encouragement uh, on my part. Yeah. So I thought it might be nice again to talk a little bit about the Buddhist suttas. I'm going to talk about meditation practice in a minute. But before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the suttas, especially for those of you who are new, yeah? what we mean by suttas, why they matter, and what this is really all about. And it's good to be reminded of these things. And when we talk about the suttas, then we are really talking about the word of the Buddha. And this is, uh, uh, of course, straight away, many questions come up. Yeah? Do we really know what the Buddha taught two and a half thousand years ago? This kind of, this, these things come up. Uh, what is wrong with kind of not with Buddhist teachings that are not the word of the Buddha? Are they wrong? Should we discard those? What should we do? And to be able to understand these things, we need to go back to some of the basic principles uh, that go back in Buddhist history. Uh, basically, and I'll talk about this in a second, but essentially go back to the time of the Buddha. And we have one of the most famous suttas, which is like a compilation of the word of the Buddha or a compilation of the history at the very end of the Buddha's life. It's called the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, which means the great passing away or the great extinguishment, something like that. And it's the sutta that leads up to the Buddha's death and the Buddha's passing away. It leads up to that. And because it is all about the Buddha's passing away, all the things that lead up to that point. Uh, it is an extraordinarily interesting sutta from a historical point of view. Uh, because this is where the Buddha lays down all those things that, that the monastics and also the lay people should, how they should act after he passes away. Yeah? And of course, those things that we, the, the Sangha, Sangha and the lay people are supposed to do after he passes away, that's very relevant to us because we are also after the time of the Buddha. 
So these things are very relevant to how we should think about Buddhism and the teachings we should take seriously and how we should uh, live the Dharma in the present day. And of course, one of the things that the Buddha says is that when I pass away, the teaching will not be taken over by some leader. There won't be a leader who takes over after I pass away. After I pass away, the teachings that I have given, this will be your teacher afterwards. Yes, there is no leader in the in the in Buddhism. There is no king of Buddhism. Have you heard of kings of Buddhism? It's interesting when you go to Thailand. Yeah, you go to some of these countries. They have the Sangha Raja. Raja is an uh, Indian word which means king, and Sangha is of course the monastic community. You have the king of the monastic community. Yeah, yeah? so there is like a king of Buddhism. But actually, the Buddha said we shouldn't have that, and still we have it. It shows you how bad we are at following the Buddha's advice. Yeah? We always get it wrong, and we have the Sangha Rajas, and we shouldn't have that. Yeah? So there shouldn't be a king of Buddhism. Buddhism is really a very decentralized uh, religion or teaching. Yeah? Every monastery is independent, every Buddhist community is independent. There is no king, there is no dictator, there is no supreme commander who kind of lays down the law for everyone else. Uh, and this is very beautiful. Yeah? It's a very wonderful way of living because it is much less prone to being corrupted, to being destroyed. As soon as you have hierarchies, everything tends to get destroyed because everyone wants power in this world. Have you noticed that how everyone is striving for power? Why do people want power? Because when you have power, you can get things done your way. You can get you know, the world to act according to your wishes and desires. Everybody wants power. But if you have no hierarchy, then there is much less potential for abuse of power. And you see this in the Buddhist countries. You see enormous problems with abuse of power because of these hierarchies. Everyone is trying to climb the hierarchy. It's terrible. Monks and nuns are supposed to be climbing the hierarchy. It's the last thing you're supposed to be doing here. You're supposed to be sitting meditation, maybe teaching a little bit. And this is the purpose of the monastic life. So that, that's why it is so interesting that the Buddha laid down no hierarchy, the suttas, the vinaya, these teachings that I have given, these will be your teachings. This will be your teacher after I pass away. So now you understand why it is so important that we try to find out what these teachings actually are, yeah? because these are our, these are our teachers. Yeah? This matters enormously suddenly, yeah? and we actually find out what the Buddha taught. Yeah? So I'll give you a very brief introduction to Buddhist history, because this is really the only way you can understand yeah, what are the early suttas and what are not. Uh, so very brief introduction, because this is a very complex topic, and if you want to read, you can read these enormous books, 2,000, 3,000 pages. And if you want to get into that, you're, you're welcome. Uh, but I will give you a brief introduction anyway, so you don't have to read 2,000 pages. Uh, it will save you a bit of time. That is if you trust me, yeah? But I don't trust me, because some of the things I say are probably wrong. Remember that. Uh, don't, you know, never trust anyone 100%. That's always a bad idea. Even if I think I'm telling you the truth, uh, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, so check out the sources for yourself. Uh. So the Buddhist history, one of the most important times in Buddhist history uh, is the time of the Emperor Ashoka. Emperor Ashoka was a great emperor in India about 150, maybe 200 years after the Buddha. Yeah, and, uh, and the, so until that point, Buddhism was quite unified. It was like one teaching. It was called the Dhamma. It wasn't even called Buddhism in those days. It was called Dhamma. Dhamma just means teaching. Yeah. At the time of Emperor Ashoka, he was the biggest emperor ever in India. Uh, maybe uh, Modi, the present, the present emperor of India, is even, he's getting it pretty powerful, isn't he? But I think Emperor Ashoka was even more powerful than uh, Prime Minister Modi in India right now. Uh, um, and uh, so he ruled this vast continent, the biggest India has ever been included, uh, countries like uh, Afghanistan and large parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan, of course, uh, and it went all the way over to Bangladesh. Uh, and the very southern tip of India was not included, but apart from that, it was a very, very large country. Uh, and uh, he became a Buddhist. Uh, this is what is so interesting. The biggest emperor in Indian history, he was a Buddhist. Uh, and because he was a Buddhist, he wanted to spread the Buddhist teachings. Uh, and one of the things that he did uh, it was to send missionaries uh, out yeah, to uh, one missionary was his son Mahinda who went to Sri Lanka, 
and uh, uh, so the, the, I don't think there is any historical reasons to doubt that this is actually true. Actually, there are some good reasons to think that this is actually what happened. Uh, uh, maybe I'll tell you a bit about that evidence in a second. Uh, and some of the other missionaries were sent to the north of India. They were sent to what is today uh, Kashmir, yeah, in the north of India, or uh, Gandhara, which is part of Afghanistan and northern Pakistan today. Uh, these missionaries were sent out to establish Buddhism around the world. Uh, it's like when you become a new, newly converted to a teaching, uh, you become very keen on that teaching. Uh, it's like when I was a young monk, I wanted to convert my parents. Yeah? It's like that, because you want to convert the whole world. This is the best. You want to convert everyone. And this is how it works. And of course, it's very silly, because it, the surest way to turn off your parents is to try to convert them. That's kind of the last thing you should do. Then. But I learned that very quickly, fortunately. Yeah. But anyway, Ashoka was like that. He was like a young monk, recently converted, and he wanted to convert the whole world. So he sent all these missionaries out. Uh, and these uh, stories of these missionaries are very interesting. They are found in a Pali work called the Samantha Pasadika, which is a commentary on the uh, dis monastic discipline. And, and it is found there, and you find the names of the various people. Some were sent to Sri Lanka, some to Kashmir, some to Gandhara, etc. And what is fascinating is that uh, about uh, uh, Maybe 20 years ago, there was an English, a British archaeologist who was working in India. And in India, they have, you may have heard about the very famous stupas at Sanchi. Have you heard about the stupas at Sanchi? Yeah, very, very famous stupas. Very beautiful, lots of beautiful carvings of the Jataka tales and all of these things. So, uh, some of the most beautiful art in all of India you find at Sanchi. So if you ever go to India, have many here been on a pilgrimage to India before now? And you want to be to India? Yeah, you want to Okay, good. So quite a few, a few of you have been to India. I've been to India many times, but never to Sanchi. Anyway, so in these ancient stupas at Sanchi, yeah, they find some reliquaries. You know, reliquaries? Uh, these are little caskets, uh, and inside the casket, they have ancient relics. Relics are bodily remains, like ashes and bones or whatever, from people that have been enshrined in those little caskets. Uh, and these caskets, they have inscriptions on them, yeah? We know that they're very ancient because they were found in an archaeological site that goes back over 2,000 years. We know that these things are very, very ancient. Yeah? And then it, when they read it, the inscriptions on these ancient caskets that were found at Sanchi, yeah? the names on those caskets, yeah? they matched the names I was talking about before in the Samatha Pasadika, the Pali, this ancient Pali commentary. Yeah? Yeah, isn't that kind of amazing? One is a book written in Sri Lanka, which is 2,000 kilometers away from Sanchi. Another one are reliquaries of ancient saints buried in India 2,000 years ago. And then when you compare them today, there is a good match between those names. And this is the kind of evidence that makes us you know, believe or makes us think with a very rational basis that these stories that we sometimes read about, they are real. This is historical fact. At the time of Ashoka, there was a big missionary movement because those missionaries are mentioned in different places that were very, very far apart. So what does this mean in practice? What it means is that Buddhism was established in different places, in Gandhara, and Sri Lanka, this is about 3,000 kilometers. Uh, today, 3,000 kilometers is nothing. I just came from Perth. When did I come? This morning. I arrived this morning. It's right. Okay. <laughs> Forgotten already. It seems like I was here all yesterday. It's like coming back. You come back to a place where you've been before. It feels like you're back. You know, it doesn't feel like it's a year ago. But anyway, it, is a, it actually is a year ago. <laughs> so, and today, very easy. But at the time of in, in ancient India, 3,000 kilometers takes a long time to, co to cover 3,000 kilometers. You can walk, or you can go by ox cart. Ox cart, have you seen ox carts? Very slow, yeah? You can bumping along in the ox cart. Very slow and very painful way of traveling, yeah? Uh, so very difficult. And so the Pali texts, which come from Sri Lanka, they developed on their own in Sri Lanka. Whereas the other texts that they developed in Kashmir, they were developed in a different school of Buddhism because once you have this geographical dispersion, you get different schools. You get the Sarvastivada school, the Dharmaguptika schools. You also have other schools that were more in central India, like the Mahasangikas and the Mahishasakas and other schools. 
But the most interesting ones are the Sarvastivad and Dharmaguptika, which were in the north of India, and then the Pali school, the Theravada, which was in Sri Lanka. They were 3,000 kilometers apart, and they collected the teachings of the Buddha separately, individually, only about 150 years after the time of the Buddha. So the suttas in Sri Lanka, they eventually became the Pali canon, and the suttas that were collected in Kashmir and Gandhara, they went with the Silk Road, they went into China. Yeah, I guess maybe not, maybe not Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is too far south. The Silk Road would come in in Xi'an, yeah, in the north of Luoyang, that, that area, it would come in through there, yeah, and then it would be transferred into Ch ancient Chinese, yeah, and then those scriptures are still available now in ancient Chinese. Or they call it, I think they call it Middle Chinese, because the ancient Chinese is even older, but whatever you call it, it's a very old dialect of Chinese. Uh, yeah, and the characters were used slightly differently, so you have to be a specialist to be able to read these things and all of that. Uh. So what is, you can see here how these schools diverged enormously, but both of them supposedly kept the word of the Buddha. And this is the important point here. Uh. So if you take the Pali text uh, and you translate the Pali text into English, uh, and then you take the ancient Chinese text, it's called the Agamas. It's a very small part of the Chinese canon, because the Chinese canon is so enormous. The tiny parts, only about three volumes. We have, I happen to have it at Bodhidharma Monastery. Nobody can read it. We just have it there. It just kind of sits there. Oh, that's the Agamas. Oh, that's really cool. Can anyone read it? No, I can't read it. <laughs> this is kind of how things really work. Can you read oh, Can you read Agamas? No, no, no really. Can anyone here read in ancient Chinese? No, no. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. You can read. Ah, you can read, of course. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, and what is so nice? We have some scholars, very good scholars who translate, like Dr. Bonan Lalayo. You know Dr. Bonan Lalayo? Yeah. yeah. So then, yeah. And so, what is so, so astonishing about this? You translate from the Pali into English. Uh, you translate from the Chinese into English, uh, and you compare, and you recognize these are the same suttas. Uh, yeah. These are the same suttas. Sometimes they are verbatim the same, almost word by word, exactly the same, after 2,300 years. Uh, one translated into Chinese, another one kept in the Pali language. They have been apart for 2,300 years, uh, and still they are the same suttas. Uh. So what that means is that those people who looked after these suttas, uh, they were incredibly conservative. Uh. They realized that they were dealing with the word of the Buddha, we have to look after it carefully because this is very precious. This is like the inheritance uh, or the thing that the Buddha bequeathed to humanity. Of course we have to look after this. So they did, they were very conservative. Yeah? And this goes back to the time of Ashoka. And there's another 150 years, maybe 200 years to the time of the Buddha. And that conservatism would have gone, obviously, we have gone all the way back to the time of the Buddha. There's no reason to think that they would have been different before that. Uh, so what that means is that we have the word of the Buddha in the present day. This is like the historical evidence, and it's pretty solid historical evidence uh, that we still have the word of the Buddha. Uh, so for this reason, we know what the word of the Buddha is, we know what is not the word of the Buddha, yeah? and the Buddha said we should take his suttas as our teacher after his passing away, he specifically said that later generations, they will be listening to all these disciples. Yeah? They will be forgetting about the word of the Buddha. And they will listen to the disciples instead. Yeah? People, like, people like me, yeah? <laughs> listening to me, or listening to Ajahn Brah, or listening to Ajahn Shah, or listening to uh, Sayado so-and-so, or listening to Rinpoche so-and-so, and all of these things. Yeah? That's who people listen to these days. Yeah? And they forget that actually the real standard for what is Buddhism is the word of the Buddha. I'm not saying you should listen to other teachers. Of course you should, because uh, very often you have to to get access. Uh, but you should always remember that the word of the Buddha is in the final analysis. Uh, that is real Buddhism. And everything else is maybe right. Sometimes it's really off. It's got nothing to do with Buddhism at all. But people still say, Sadhu, 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 what a wonderful teaching. Uh, not really knowing what they're talking about. Uh, very common, yeah. It's a uh, very strange. It's very easy. You travel to Buddhist countries sometimes, you know, and people are so respectful of monks. Uh, I don't know Hong Kong. Hong Kong people are maybe a bit more balanced, but in some countries, they're super duper respectful. Uh, and as soon as you open your mouth, whatever you say, whatever rubbish comes out, uh, people say, "Oh, sorry, sorry, what a wonderful teaching!" Uh, 
like, oh no, I can't. <laughs> that was the, it's, it's, sometimes it's too easy. So we need to reflect, we need to actually be honest about where these real teachings are here. So this is what I'm going to focus on, are these teachings of the Buddha. This is what is going to be the focus. And uh, so hopefully you will feel a bit inspired. They can become a bit dry here. And this is the advantage of having someone teach them, because you can kind of spruce them up a little bit to make them a bit more interesting. Especially when you have a teacher like Ajahn Brahm, he's always very good at making things interesting. Yeah? Always uh, peppered in a lot of jokes. And you know that ancient, perhaps it's an old Tibetan saying, which is that you, uh, you, you tell them a few good stories, uh, and when their mouth is open, yeah, and they're laughing so loudly, ha ha ha, that's when you throw in the pit of wisdom. Uh. <laughs> and there's some truth to that, yeah, because when you are laughing, when you are relaxing, when you are enjoying yourself, you are, you are relaxed, you are at ease. And when you are at ease, that's when you can listen to the teachings. Uh. If you're not at ease, if you're tense, it's very hard to take on board uh, any teaching, let alone profound spiritual teachings. Uh. So that is a, just a bit of background for you about why I like to do things this way, because I like to get straight to the Buddha's teachings himself. Uh. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on very briefly, and I, actually I should also say that there will be plenty of opportunities to ask questions. Uh, yeah, there will be, uh, uh, where is the question, Stella? You're the question master here. Yeah. Where, where can people write their questions? At the back, okay. So you can write down the questions, uh, yeah? And I will do my best to answer them. And please feel free to ask any questions you like. Yeah, yeah? you don't have to be rude, of course. But I, I, know, I know you're not going to be rude anyway, so it's not a problem. Please feel free to ask questions, because uh, it's good uh, to be, uh, feel, feel that liberty to ask whatever you want. Uh. So, uh, uh, take that opportunity, and then in the evening we will talk about uh, these things. So. But another thing which is very nice right at this moment, and you may think I'm joking that it is nice, but you have all these problems here in Hong Kong, yeah? In Australia we can read about Hong Kong, all these demonstrations going on, and all these clashes between the police and demonstrators, and, and uh, it looks really kind of scary. Yeah? And uh, I got an email from Gerald, they were saying, oh, they're cancelling all these talk, Buddhist talks and things in Hong Kong, because uh, People think it's the wrong time, you know, to come to Hong Kong and teach, especially if it is a very large venue, maybe where there's hundreds or thousands of people coming here. But actually, it is really the other way around. It is when you have suffering, when you have problems, when the world is going wrong, that is a really good time to have spiritual teachings. Because when the world goes wrong, you understand the limitations of the world. You understand it can only take you so far. It will always be a degree of suffering and problems in the world. Uh, what is the future of Hong Kong? It's very uncertain, isn't it? Uh, how is it? I mean, in the end, uh, the Chinese government is obviously very, very strong. So in the end, it's going to be basically the Chinese system, uh, in mainland China, is going to be, be here in Hong Kong. Uh, and some people like that, some people don't like that. Uh, but that's the reality. Maybe, who knows? I'm not going to, I'm going to predict the future, but uh, something like that. Uh, and. Uh, for those people who are who don't like that, uh, it's going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be suffering. It's going to be problematic. Uh, and the whole world is kind of full of these kind of problems. Uh, you look at the United States. Yeah, you have a problem with the government in the U.S. Lots of problems over there. Uh, you look at the U.K. Lots of problems. They've been messing around. We're trying to get out of Europe for what is it? Three years. And they can't can't get their act together. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a comedy show after a while. When you look at what's happening in the U.K. <laughs> It's really funny. Or you have the climate change, yeah? It, was, it seems to be getting worse and worse. And of course you have the wars, always wars going on. Human beings love to love war. Isn't that right? We love to go to war, but we also suffer enormously as a consequence. So there's all these problems going on. And Hong Kong has its own share, share of problems. And this is a very powerful reminder of the limitations of the world. We don't know the future. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know when the next world war might happen. All of these things are possible. We don't know when we're going to die personally. And because of this, because of this inherent problem of the world, it means that once we get that, and we get that at times of difficulty like now, once we start to get that, we start to understand that if you want to be happy, if you want a, state, a kind of stability in our life, if you want something more profound, we have to turn our attention somewhere else. And that somewhere else is, of course, to the spiritual path. 
Because the spiritual path is very different from the ordinary worldly path. If we rely on our happiness because of how society is run, to have the right government, to, for things to work out in, our, in, you know, in the right way, we're always going to be miserable because society is never going to work out exactly the way you want it to. This is just the nature of society. This is one of the core teachings of the Buddha, the idea of anicca, of instability, of impermanence, of unreliability. Yeah? So instead, we look at the inner world. Because the inner world is something we can do something about. Every one of us has an ability to develop our own mind, to be kind, to have the right kind of intentions. So we start to focus instead on that area in life where we have some degree of control, where we can actually do something. We understand the problems of the external world, and we start to move inside instead. And this is the power of living at a time when there is problems. Yeah? It opens our eyes to the limitations of the world. Uh, so nothing is really lost if we react to it in the right way. Actually, a lot can be gained from a little bit of suffering, uh, even a lot of suffering. It's how we deal with it that really matters. Uh, and if you deal with it in the right way, then it's going to be very beneficial, uh, rather than being something which is problematic. Uh, it's very strange because we think that we know what is beneficial, we think that when everything goes well and everything is fine, that's beneficial. That's what people tend to think. Yeah, yeah everything is going well. But actually, when things go well, we tend to become heedless. We tend to think, yeah, yeah everything is going well, let's carry on, nothing to think about. And we become stupid because things are going well. It's actually when things are difficult that we start to think, that we start to reflect, and we start to change our attitude to the world. That is really when spiritual development man becomes more possible. It's always about an insight into suffering, an insight into the problems of the world. So uh, I'm probably I'm going to talk more about this later on because this is a very important point. Yeah. So uh, and uh, so it's good. And obviously, every one of you who are here, you have some appreciation of the spiritual life already. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. No point in being here if you didn't have any appreciation of the spiritual life. So you already have some of this appreciation, yeah. so you're already basically on the right track. And this just reinforces that, that whole idea. So, um, now let us uh, change the track a little bit. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation practice, uh, because that is kind of the root idea of this retreat. Uh, Let's give you some advice on how to get your meditation together. And this will be like the main teaching on meditation that I give here tonight. And then I will reinforce that by giving guided meditations during the retreat. Uh, so that's enough as far as background is concerned. And now let's get on to the more meaty part of what, uh, what this retreat is about. Uh, so one of the, uh, to start off, one of the things that you see in the suttas again and again when it comes to meditation practice uh, is that uh, uh, there's always a basis, there's something, meditation is always founded on something else. Uh, meditation is not a stand-alone thing that you do without any kind of support from other factors. Uh, the, no the Buddhist path is a noble eightfold path, it has eight factors, it is not the one-fold path, but the meditation path. Sometimes you read about mindfulness movement, you might think there's only a one-fold path. Mindfulness is everything there is, and everything else is irrelevant. But actually, no, there's an eight-fold path. And when you read some of the core suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, what he has to say about meditation practice, and one of the most important suttas, it is important because you see it in many different places, is called the Anapanasati Sutta. Anapanasati means literally mindfulness of in and out breath. That's what it means. And I would, if you don't have any particular meditation that you'd like to do, I would recommend you to try at least a little bit of Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, while you are here. Because it is very important. It was used by the Buddha himself for his awakening, and he taught it to afterwards to, uh, uh, to his disciples. This is one of those interesting things about the Buddha. Sometimes people think, oh, the Buddha is one level, we are a different level. But actually, in the suttas, it doesn't really work like that. In the suttas, the Buddha teaches his, the way he practices, or practiced, is the way he teaches to others. 
So he actually asks us to follow in his footsteps quite literally here. Yeah. So when you read the Sutta, the discourse on Anapanasati, on mindfulness of breathing, yeah, yeah, the Buddha doesn't say, sit down and watch your breath straight away. Yeah. Sometimes that's what people do, they sit down straight away and start watching the breath. Yeah. And it's too late, it's too early, because it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So the Buddha says, when you do Anapanasati, yeah, the first thing you should do is to sit down, yeah, sit down comfortably, and just give a few instructions about how to sit down. Yeah. And I'll talk about that in a second. But then he says, having established mindfulness. Yeah, so you have to have mindfulness first before you actually start watching the breath. Watching the breath is not is not there to help you establish mindfulness. If you haven't got mindfulness, you can't really watch the breath. So you start off by, by establishing mindfulness, which means a degree of clarity in the mind, a degree of awareness of what is going on. Once that is in place, then you start watching the breath. So this is one of those uh, critical things to understand about meditation practice, is to get things in the right sequence. If we don't understand the sequence of how things are developed, if we start with things that are too advanced, if you come here and say, yeah, this is I'm going to get enlightenment, or this is I'm going to get jhanas or whatever, already you are on the wrong track. Yeah, we don't really, don't really think like that when it comes to Buddhist meditation practice. So instead, you say, okay, I'm going to start off, establish mindfulness, then watch the breath and see what happens. That's a more realistic attitude toward these things. So get the sequence right. Establish mindfulness first of all. Another important sutta is the Satipatthana Sutta, which many of you probably have heard about. Yeah? It's kind of used very frequently to, as a meditation instruction. And Satipatthana Sutta says exactly the same thing. In the introduction it says you have to be Satipa. And Satipa means having mindfulness. So you cannot do Satipatthana practice without establishing mindfulness first. This is kind of the prerequisite for a meditation practice in all circumstances. So this is already very useful. Yeah? Get the sequence right. Know, know the right time then you will be getting much more out of this meditation practice. So how do we do this? And uh, the starting point, a good starting point, is to start with the idea of the middle way. I'm going to talk about meditation pretty much as I always talk about it. But start out with the idea of the middle way. This is the very first teaching of the Buddha after his awakening according to the story as we have it in the suttas goes and meets the five monks who were supported before him. And here the first thing he tells them is, I have discovered this middle path. Yeah? And of course, this middle path is forgotten by the vast majority of Buddhists. Because, I don't know why, but because I think the human mind has a tendency to veer, we tend to veer to extremes. Yeah? We tend to like a bit of self-torment. I don't know why, but we seem to kind of enjoy that. Or we veer too far towards the pleasures of the world. In both cases, doesn't work yet. So remember the middle way. And the biggest danger on a retreat like this, because we are often used to a more comfortable life at home, the biggest danger is to torment yourself too much. You have to try to sit and to kind of force yourself into sitting for an hour or two hours and endure pains and all of these kind of things. Please don't do that, because basically it doesn't work. Of course, a little bit of pain is to be expected when you meditate, but don't endure for long periods of time, because what happens is that the mind becomes obsessed with the pain usually, and then there's no way you're going to get anywhere. You're just going to be watching pain, and actually you won't be able to be mindful, you won't enjoy yourself, and when you have too much pain, the mind gets distracted, you start to fantasize about things, and you start to have all kinds of problems as a consequence of that pain and problems in the body. So find a posture that is a, a comfortable. You will notice that, look at this, this thing I have, this really comfortable thing, yeah? this big thing, I'm leading by example. Yeah? It's like I got a really, really comfortable seat. I told them I give me lots of cushions so I can be really comfortable. <laughs> and then why? Well, because I want to show you kind of the right way of doing this so you can be really relaxed, so you can sit for long periods of time. So find a posture that is at ease, you can feel comfortable, and you can enjoy yourself. And you will find that after sitting a while, you will start to get pains regardless, 
Yeah, this human body is really useless. It's full of pains and pr problems all the time. And it's one of the, you know, sometimes this is why people want to get reborn in the heavenly realm and get rid of these human bodies that are so, so problematic. Yeah. Uh, that's a separate topic, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, so, if you feel pain after a while, change your posture. Yeah. You don't have to sit 100% still all the time. Uh, if you move after half an hour, it's not going to have a very big impact on your meditation. If you do it carefully and gently, yeah. it is okay to sit in different kinds of postures. Uh, sometimes you can sit cross-legged. Uh, sometimes you can sit on a chair. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you can lean against the wall or lean against the back here. Sometimes you can lie down. Uh, we have some people like lie. Do we have some? No. In some retreat centers they have like they have a you know. A, a sofa or something in the back, people lying on the sofa and seeing that. And, and, and it was interesting. This, this fellow, he was lying on the sofa. I said, wow, it was so good. I got my best meditation when I was lying on the sofa. And I thought, cool, yeah, you have understood something. And he was probably getting so much pain in his body, he just had to lie down, and then he got some really good meditation. And this is like some of the best meditators I know, they actually lie down sometimes, but they get very good meditation as a consequence. Because when you lie down, you can relax. Of course, you can also fall asleep, and that's a, that's, a, that's a different kind of thing. So you know, you may. But even if you fall asleep, at least you at least you relax. Yeah, you can't really fall asleep. Sometimes you you need that just to kind of chill out a little bit before the meditation comes together. Yeah. So use your posture wisely. Yeah. And the wise posture, the good posture, is the one where you don't have too much pain. Yeah. You're not forcing yourself too much. Yeah. You're not forcing yourself into this extreme that the Buddha is talking about. Uh, the other side of the, uh, the middle way is where you indulge too much. Is to, well, you're not going to be able to indulge too much here. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully not. I hope you don't. <laughs> you're probably not. Yeah, you're going to be. You're going to follow these precepts roughly, and you're going to be practicing here. So there's more danger of falling into the torment and to fall into the other side. Uh, so because of that. Uh, uh, Watch out for the self-torment, most of all. Uh, and what happens, if you get this right, uh, if you find that this balance right, where you don't indulge too much in the body, and you don't torment the body, uh, the consequence of that is that uh, the body becomes irrelevant. Uh, yeah? We are interested in the body because it gives us pleasure, you know, we eat or we do whatever, it gives us pleasure on the one hand, uh, or we are interested in the body uh, because there is pain in the body, we want to get rid of the pain. Uh, this is why the body is interesting. But if there is no pain and there's no pleasure in the body, the body becomes irrelevant. And when the body becomes irrelevant, when the body, then the body starts to fade away and you are left with the mind. And mental development is one way of thinking about the spiritual path. It's actually a word used by the Buddha a lot in the suttas, citta bhavana. Citta bhavana means literally development of the mind. That's what it means. So this is what it's about. And to develop the mind, you've got to get the body out of the way. This is how you get the body out of the way, that middle path where the body is irrelevant to. Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's kind of obvious when you think about it. And yet, we still make that mistake all the time. If you go on meditation retreats, and sometimes people make this mistake so much. Some of these meditation retreats, 90% of people never come back again. Yeah? It's true, that is true. Why? Because it's so painful. Yeah. And uh, here we have a bit more success because I <laughs> a bit more people coming back, which is nice. Uh, so, and this is terrible because the Buddhist path, the spiritual path, has so much potential. We want to encourage people to come back uh, and not lose that potential which the path actually has. Uh. So this is the very first point. Middle path, Majjhima Patipada is uh, the Pali word for the middle path. Uh. And uh, it's nice to have some monastics here because you know this Pali words, uh, so you can vouch for my, my truth. Yeah? I'm not going to mess it, I'm not pretending, I'm actually telling the real thing. Yeah? You, 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 you know Pali quite well, is that right? Yeah? yeah? You know Pali as well? Yeah? A little bit. A little bit, okay. Ch ancient Chinese and Pali, wow, I, that's really <laughs> pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, these are the really educated, educated people. Uh. So uh, this is the first thing. Yeah? The second, uh, thing on this path is to remember to keep it very simple. Uh, yeah, mindfulness of breathing. Breathing is not a very complicated thing. Uh, yeah, I mean we breathe all the time; it's not a problem. It's very simple. Uh, 
So the reason why it is still hard or the reason why it doesn't work is again because our mind is not really prepared, yeah? But the actual thing, the meditation is a very, very simple thing. Once you get it, you think, what could be simpler than watching the breath? Our lives are usually so complicated, but meditation is one of the simplest things you can do. So don't overcomplicate it. Yeah, just allow things to be. Don't try to make things be. Don't try to. We are so used to making things be in our lives, creating things, forcing ourselves to watch the breath, working really hard, using the willpower. Here, it is a very different thing that we're supposed to do. That is to withdraw that willpower from our uh, meditation practice and just allow things to be here. Simple, very, very simple, simplify to the maximum. And uh, this is uh, encapsulated very nicely in the Buddhist uh, Sutta. There's a very beautiful Sutta called the Chaitanya Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay, don't worry too much about it. Uh, this is just a certain uh, Sutta, certain discourses by the Buddha that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, and, and according to this Chaitanya Sutta, the Buddha specifically says that the progress in meditation uh, cannot be made to happen through an act of will. Specifically, na chetanaya karaniya is a good tense number two. And na chetanaya karaniya means not to be done by the will. Chetanaya is the will, is intention. What that means is that if you use will, if it cannot be done by will, then if you use the will, then you're not going to get there. It's not going to work. The Buddha says it's a dhammata. Dhammata means according to nature. Yeah, according to the laws of nature, and as long as you have put in place the prerequisite, meditation will happen automatically. It's an automatic process that happens all by itself if the foundation is solid. What is that foundation? And this foundation I'm going to talk about more later. Well, the foundation is basically two things. Two things that are required for meditation to work. One is right view, thinking about the world, the world in the right way, and the other one is virtue or morality. These are the two critical things that make meditation possible. If you have the right kind of view and you have a very powerful moral conduct, meditation will happen. If your meditation is not happening, that's where you have to look for the solution. It is not about, am I watching the breath in the right way? Sometimes people think, oh, am I watching the breath in the right way? Should I watch it differently? How many ways are there to watch the breath? It goes in and it goes out. You know, you can you to do so much for the breath that uh, it's not kind of a magic trick to watch the breath in one way or another one. Uh, so you, uh, it's simple, it's basic, all you have to do is stand back, allow the process to unfold and not do very much. Uh, and this is especially important at the beginning, because at the beginning when you come here, uh, you're probably all, many of you probably come from work, yeah, have a long long weeks of work and then you have all these protests happening, all these problems going on. You probably be tired, you come here, and then when you're tired, you, first of all, the mind may think a lot, or you, after thinking a lot, you might get even more tired and you feel fall asleep maybe. So if you snore in here, please snore. Yeah? If you snore, we're going to have compassion on again. Yeah, well done, you're snoring. It's really nice to snore in public. Yeah, it's like really unselfconscious, just... <laughs> So don't, don't have any, don't get upset if someone is snoring, have compassion instead. This is one of those critical things in a community like this, always have compassion and kindness for the people around you. So just allow it to be, allow it to unfold. And if it means falling asleep, so be it. If it means the mind thinking, so be it. And as you are patient, as you allow this to happen and unfold by itself, as you just keep the rules, you keep the silence, you will gradually see the mind becoming more peaceful, naturally, according to nature. It's dhammata. Dhammata means according to the laws of nature. Very, very beautiful. It's very beautiful because it's very unforced. Yeah, there's no willpower there. And you will find that one of the most terrible things about modern society, I know Hong Kong is very famous for this kind of society where people work incredibly hard and you put a lot of pressure on yourself to work really hard. Hong Kong is bad. Singapore, I go to Singapore quite a lot as well. Singapore is a bit like Hong Kong, you know? These two societies are famous for these things. But actually, it's everywhere around the world these days. So people working too much, getting stressed out. 
So we are so used to this willpower because of the way we have been conditioned by society, here we're trying to do the exact opposite. And that is why it is difficult because of our strong conditioning. So here we have to learn to allow things to be instead. And to be able to do that, you have to learn one of those tricks to do this is to be content. Yeah, to be allow things to be to be content. If you are perfectly content, it means you have no desires. You don't want to go anywhere. And if you have no desires, then of course the will is going to die down. <laughs> so when the will dies down like that, because you have no desire, that is when meditation happens. So contentment is one of the powerful ways of actually finding that lack of willpower, allowing things to be. So see if you can be content while you're here. If you are 100% content, your meditation is going to be 100% powerful. Yeah, so try to be 100% content. How can we be 100% content? And this is where the idea of sila and right view and all of these things come into it. But the basic idea is just to kind of know that there is nothing really more to be had in the world than what you have here. What you get here is kind of the optimal, the optimum thing to get in the world. Once you get into this idea that this is really what it's all about, uh, this is what life is all about, uh, then you don't want anything else, uh, then you can be really content. Uh. There's a beautiful simile, I think actually it is in there. Did you get those suttas printed out? Have you got the suttas? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's actually in there, the sin, I'll talk about it later on. Uh, there's a beautiful simile in the suttas about contentment. Uh, and it's for the monastics, it says that you are content, you're just like a bird with its, with the, its wings as its only bird. Uh, and it's, a, it's this beautiful idea of a, like a bird, you're free, you're soaring in the sky, and the only bird you have are the wings. And of course the wings are part of the bird, so it isn't much of a bird at all. In the same way, you are here, you have nothing, you have a simple life, you don't have very much, but you are free because you are content with that, you don't want anything more. So see if you can get into this idea of contentment on this retreat. Enjoy what you have, enjoy the good company. This is one of the most important things to be content, is to enjoy the good company. Yeah? I always like to point out, because it's so easy to become fault-finding with the people around you, because you live quite closely together, and yeah, you're probably sharing rooms, many of you. I'm very lucky, I get my own room. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very fortunate. I, I, <laughs> I'm divulging the secrets here. But, uh, but remember that uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, the people, everyone who is here, is someone who is uh, trying to do something very noble and very beautiful. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So always look upon your fellow meditators uh, with eyes of kindness, because these are good people who are here. Who on earth would want to be here if you, if you had some kind of spark of goodness inside of you? It's impossible. Otherwise, it's completely pointless to be here. If you are a gangster, uh, and the gangsters here? Yes. Yes. I told you, yes. Oh, all the gangsters. Whoa, okay. Uh, okay, what shall we do? What shall we do then? What will that? Kick her out. <laughs> no, I think she's just joking around. I think I tell her something gangster. So, uh, okay, I always ask this question, but nobody ever raises the hand, yes, I'm a gangster. So it's uh, except for Delma, because she's very cheeky. That's not the only reason. Uh, so people are good. Uh, so remember that, yeah? If you get a little bit irritated, uh, remember these are good people. No need to get irritated. Uh, and remember the big picture. If you do that, you're going to have a very smooth and much more content retreat. Uh. So allow things to be here. Uh, don't use willpower. Just be content. Go with the flow of things. Uh. One of the things in the world, we always try to go against the flow. We use our willpower to get our way. Uh. It doesn't work in meditation. In meditation, you have to allow things to arise naturally. And as you do that, there's a magical thing that happens as you do that. And as you do that, mindfulness starts to arise. And mindfulness is a very simple thing. Mindfulness is a, a, when you start to get become more aware. Yeah? You start to get a feeling for what is happening. And you start to know, you know, know what is going on. And sometimes if you're not mindful and you're thinking about things, you're kind of in the stream of your thought, fully occupied with those thoughts, without having any kind of external view as to what is going on. You don't really know that you're thinking, it's just going on and on and on. And suddenly you say, oh, I'm thinking, wow, 
that, that's when mindfulness kicks in, when you are aware that you're being carried on, carried along in these thoughts, in these fantasies, or whatever they are. Yeah. So mindfulness is this awareness of what is happening. Yeah. And the idea is, of course, in meditation practice, uh, is that awareness to arise, first of all, so we know what is going on, and then use that awareness, place that awareness on the object of meditation. But if you haven't given rise to mindfulness, first of all, and you try to be aware of the breath, it's just going to be confusion. It's not real mindfulness, not really aware of the breath. You're just confused in a sense. So leave the breath aside in the beginning. First of all, feel the awareness arise, a certain degree of clarity, a certain degree of peace inside. And when you feel you have that clarity and peace, it's almost as if you have a distance to things. Yeah, very often it's like we're completely involved with the world, there's no distance between us and the world. But it's like you're pulling back a little bit. And you have a degree of distance between you and the object, you're not really involved. What does that mean? It means that you're not really attached, yeah? You're kind of withdrawing a little bit. It's like if you have a really strong mindfulness and someone does something to upset you, you don't react because you're just observing it. When you're just observing, there's no reaction is really possible. So if you get someone who kind of yells at you and tells you off, you're just observing, you think, oh yeah, this person is yelling. You know? <laughs> That, that's, how you, that's how it feels if you have really strong mindfulness because you have withdrawn, you no longer have that strong tie or bond to that person who is there. This is how you know you're mindful. You have withdrawn a little bit, you have awareness, and you have a degree of clarity in your mind. And when that arises, that is when meditation becomes possible. So mindfulness arises, it comes in a large number of degrees. The idea is to make it as powerful as possible. And you do that through this path that we're talking about now, just by being aware, just by allowing things to be, especially in the beginning, not doing anything, is it? and allowing it to come about. There's two things in particular that stop you from being mindful. And those two things are the past and the future. Yeah? When you, uh, the mind kind of starts to think, it is usually about the past or the future. Yeah? So how can we get rid of the baggage of the past and the future? You may have heard Adam Brown talk about the two suitcases. One suitcase is the past, the other one is the future. And we carry these around with us, really heavy suitcases. Yeah? And we wonder why the world is so full of pain. Well, it's because we carry the suitcases. Let them go. Don't carry suitcases around everywhere. You can imagine if you, as soon as you get up in the morning, you grab these two really heavy suitcases, and you carry them with you all day. That's what we're doing. This is kind of carrying the future and the past with us. So we need to let go of those suitcases. And when you do that, you find yourself becoming light and bright inside. The mind becomes light because you're not carrying these heavy burdens with you anymore. So how can we do that? And I'll give you just a couple of indications of how to give rid of these thoughts about the past and the future. So the future, uh, the reason that we uh, think, <laughs> think you have the future, okay, no problems, yeah, just uh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> so the, the reason why we uh, think about the future is very often because, you know, there are things that we need to do, there are, we have expectations about the future, we have problems that need to be resolved, we have work, um, responsibilities, family responsibilities. And so the future is always about resolving things, trying to work out the world, to make the world be in a certain way. We can control the world or control our lives. And yeah, this is what the thinking about the future is about. Uh, but uh, this, this is why uh, the protests you've had in Hong Kong over the last four, few months are so useful as a a lesson in how to deal with the future because it shows you that it is so unreliable. Yeah, how uncertain is it? If, if you get upset by these protests, or you get upset by the government, or you get upset by both, or you get upset in general, whatever it is, it's because you had a different expectation. You didn't want Hong Kong to be like this, you wanted Hong Kong to be a peaceful place, not to have all these kind of problems. Your expectation is the problem. That is where the problem arises. 
you know, every time you want to resolve something and you want to deal, uh, fix something in your life, you want to change something, yeah, it's because you have an expectation, you have an idea about the future, yeah, you have some kind of vision that you're trying to attain. Yeah. But remember, the point of the Buddha is the future is completely unknowable. Yeah. We don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. Yeah? In many ways, we don't really have a future. Yeah. Because that future we think we have is actually it's going to be very different from that. It's never going to be the way you think it's going to be. Yeah. So if you are the kind of person, and almost everyone is like this, you feel disappointed if things go wrong, and you feel bad about things not going as you expect them to do, the problem is your expectations about the future. Yeah. If you take away all the expectations about the future, you actually find that the future becomes completely uninteresting. Yeah. If the future is completely out of control, if the future is going to give you all kinds of things that are very unpleasant and very different from what you think, it's no longer interesting. Because you know there is no goal there, there is no real purpose, because that purpose that you think you have doesn't actually exist. It's going to be different from that. Once there is no goal, once there is no real aim in the future, and this I'm going to talk more about this later on, the future is kind of becomes irrelevant. Yeah. So remember that, that the future actually is so uncertain. There's no point in thinking about it. It's not going to be the way you think it's going to be anyway. So allow it to be. And just forget about it at the very least during this retreat. And then you can, you know, you we will inevitably pick it up a little bit later on. But that goallessness of the future is actually a very useful way of thinking about it. And especially if you think about Buddhism in the kind of very broad picture, and the idea of rebirth and all of these kind of things, and the idea that there's no goal in Buddhism, we're just kind of wandering on and on and on, doing the same stupid things again and again and again. Silly, silly things, a better word is be silly. <laughs> then uh, we, you, do, you lose interest because it is quite pointless, the whole exercise. So that is the future. Yeah? There's nothing there to really be looked forward to because it is just too uncertain. Uh, what about the past? Uh, and the way that a lot of thinking uh, is also about the past. We think about how people treated us, uh, what they said to us, they weren't nice, they said the wrong thing, or maybe you, you, have a, maybe you feel guilty or bad about something you said or you did, so you think about that. Uh, yeah? It's always really in relation to other people, usually, when we think about the past. Uh, so one of the most important things to do, and if you find yourself being preoccupied with the past, is to learn to forgive. When you forgive in a deep way, then you also let go. Letting go and forgiving are just two sides of the same coin. So learn to forgive the past. And the way to do that is to remember that almost everybody in this world, if they do something which is bad, if they do something which is wrong, it is not because they want to be bad people, it's because they have been conditioned in a certain way. And if someone talks to you in a nasty and unpleasant way, it's because of their inner conditioning. It's got nothing to do with you. Yeah, it's not, it's not your problem, it's their problem. And once you understand it's their problem, you don't take it so seriously anymore. It's because we take these things personally, that's why we get upset by these things. But actually, if someone is shouting at you, it's their problem. An Arahant, the Buddha, would never shout at you because they know better. It's the other person's problem. And once you understand that they are trapped in that problem, they are trapped in their own delusion, they are trapped in their own darkness, they are trapped in their own conditioning, they are trapped in this program. They're like robots running on a program. Yeah? And because they're like robots running on a program, they can't help themselves from being stupid, from being silly, from being deluded, and from doing all kinds of bad things. It's very powerful. So I, you know, when it comes to Hong Kong, I don't, I'm a Buddhist monk, I don't really take sides in these kind of issues because it's a political issue. But whatever it is, if you are angry with the police, or you're angry with the demonstrators, or you're angry with both, or you're angry with whatever, yeah, remember, they're all just like robots. Yeah, they're all carrying out this program that is written inside of them. Yeah? And because of that, there's no need to be angry yeah? There's no need to kind of tap anyone off. It is just nature playing out. And when you see people in this way, you can forgive everybody. There's no one in the world you can't forgive. It's a very beautiful way of looking at the world because it means that uh, uh, you can go with the flow and you can allow things to be. Uh, 
next time people, someone is shouting at you, just look at them. You say, and you, you just kind of, you don't, don't say anything, because if you say something, you make it worse. But you kind of think, oh, actually, this person, they have a problem. Maybe I can be kind to them in the future to kind of you know, help them out or whatever. You know? That is the right way of thinking about other people who have this kind of problem. Then. Very beautiful way of living. And it makes you able to also forgive yourself, uh, because you start to realize that you too are conditioned very strongly. Uh, it feels like we have free will. It feels like we can do whatever we want. Uh, that's because you don't really understand yourself very well. Uh, the more carefully you look at yourself, uh, the more you realize how conditioned you are. Uh, whether there is a little bit of free will or not, it's kind of irrelevant. The vast majority is conditioning. Uh, yeah? And this is kind of the issue here. Uh, then you can forgive yourself. Uh, when you can forgive others and you can forgive yourself, you become so free. Yeah, it's so free. Yeah? And all the bad things you did in the past, okay, you shrug your shoulders, it's okay, I will just condition, I will do better in the future. Yeah, yeah you don't think, I'm just conditioned so I can do bad things in the future, that's not how you think. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking, I'm conditioned, and now I will reprogram that conditioning so I don't make the same mistakes in the future. But you don't judge yourself in a bad way. Yeah. This is the way you forgive. And then when you forgive like this, you can let go, you can come on this retreat, let the past be here, and then you can become peaceful inside, and then the meditation is going to work. Yeah. So that is how to uh, improve that mindfulness even further, make it even more powerful. Yeah? And uh, the final ingredient on this path is uh, if mind once mindfulness is there and you're able to let go of the past and the future, the final ingredient, which really is going to take your, your meditation a long way, is the joy and the happiness of the meditation practice. All the meditation the Buddha talks about is about joy and happiness, such an incredibly powerful ingredient. And the reason why it matters so much is because if you are joyful inside, if you feel real joy, it is very easy to meditate. If the breath is joyful, if the breath is happy, you can't get enough of the breath. Yeah, it's like, I was going to say it's like being hanging out with your boyfriend or girlfriend, but actually it's much better than that, yeah? Because this is real, this is a spiritual joy, which is much more pure, much more beautiful. Uh, like hanging out with something, uh, something very, very, very beautiful. Uh, and because of that, your full, it's very easy to be fully focused on something which is so pleasant. Uh, this is the idea behind bringing up the beauty of the meditation experience, experience finding happiness in it, uh, finding joy in it, uh, all of these kind of things. This sutta I mentioned before, which is called the uh, Chaitanya Sutta, or the Will or Intention Sutta, it shows the sequence of meditation, how it arises. It starts off with sila, which is like virtue, morality, then it goes to non-remorse, which is like the second one. Uh, and then from there, all the factors are about happiness. From non-remorse comes <coughs> pamuja. Pamuja means like gladness, it's a kind of joy. From Pamuja comes Piti. Piti is another, more joy. From Piti comes Pasadi. Pasadi is tranquility, which is also incredibly pleasant when you become really peaceful and really nice. From Pasadi comes Sukha. Sukha is a profound sense of happiness. From Sukha comes Samadhi. Samadhi is a deep meditation that uh, is one of the pivotal points on the meditation path uh, when you become incredibly peaceful the mind starts to become very, very powerful. And from that comes the insights uh, into the nature of reality, the nature of the mind in particular. Yeah, yeah and if you look at that sequence, you will see it's all about happiness. Yeah, happiness, more and more and more happiness, building up through your meditation practice. Yeah. It's so beautiful, yeah, it's so, I don't know, there's something about it which is incredibly attractive. Yeah. And it's there for every one of you. Yeah. Every one of you have access to these things. As long as you are committed enough, as long as you keep on investigating where your shortcomings are, you will eventually get to this kind of happiness on the Buddhist path. And sometimes it may take a long time, but it doesn't matter how long it takes, because this is about the very meaning of life itself. When you get to these things, you start to realize, actually, this is what I've been looking for all along. Everything. I was looking for in the external world, you find inside of yourself, right here, in meditation practice. The external world will never give you those things. We look in the wrong place. 
because we are deluded, because we don't really understand. Turn your attention around, practice in the right way, you find everything inside of yourself. It's amazing, yeah, it's astonishing. It takes a Buddha to see this thing. In many ways it's so obvious, but still it takes a spiritual genius like the Buddha to be able to see how this actually works and how, it, uh, and how to teach it to others afterwards. It's such an amazing path, all about happiness, more and more happiness, until you experience so much happiness, like you, you don't think you can take any more happiness. That's what Adam Brown says, you can't take any more happiness, you think you're going to explode with happiness or something. Yeah. But of course you're not, you can't take it. Yeah, and then you move towards the very sense that you found the meaning of life itself. Because this is what everyone wants in life. You want to be happy. You want to get rid of all the suffering and the problems. You want to find a state where you are content. Yeah, we all want to be content. Why are we craving for things, desiring things? Because we want to find a condition where we are satisfied. You can't find it by craving. You can only find it inside of yourself through this particular path. That's where it starts to happen. It's an amazing thing yeah, that you actually find the, me the very meaning of life. You find it through this alternative way of looking at things, uh, through the happiness of meditation practice. Uh. So how can you get there? How can you encourage your meditation during these four days to gain some of that happiness? Uh? And, uh, and the first thing is, again, not to push yourself too hard. Yeah, Don't push yourself at all, ideally. Just come here, sit down, and just enjoy it. The second thing, as I mentioned before, is to uh, kind of look at your fellow meditators with kindness and with a sense of appreciation. Yeah, These are all wonderful people. And when you have a sense of... I'm getting a bit of cramp in my toes or something. That's bad, I'm making a bad example. <laughs> so, you uh, have an appreciation with meditators. When you have a sense of appreciation of the people around you, when you have a sense of metta towards them. Everyone knows the word metta. Metta means like loving kindness, yeah? And what that means, loving kindness, really, all it means is seeing the good qualities in the people around you. If you see the good qualities of people around you, you have metta almost by definition. So remember the good qualities of the people here. And this is kind of the first step. And if you sit down and you just close your eyes and you just feel the good vibe, and you feel the good qualities of everyone, that's already very, very powerful, very, very useful. This is one of the first things. Another thing that is often very useful to get your meditation going is to have a sense of gratitude, yeah? A sense of gratitude for all the good things in your life, all the good, especially in your spiritual life, the fact that you have all of these teachings available, the fact that you have good companions who can support you, the fact that you uh, are here at the Kaduri Center, that you had the opportunity to be here, uh, have gratitude for yourself, to taking yourself here, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, by having a sense of gratitude to the Buddha, to the Dhamma, and to all of these things, uh, again, so we have a positive uh, experience of, of life, a ex positive experience of being right here. Uh, to see if you can have a bit of gratitude. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, someone like Ajahn Brahm, for example, uh, who is my teacher, uh, it's very hard not to have gratitude towards Ajahn Brahm because he works so incredibly hard. Uh, and for Ajahn Brahm, there's always, everything he does is an act of generosity, of kindness. Uh, he doesn't get anything out of it uh, apart from happiness himself. Uh, that's what he gets out of it. Uh, everything he does is just part of his spiritual practice. Uh, and he does it to help people around the world. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, and each one of us, we are beneficiaries of that kindness. Uh, the Buddha is exactly the same. I was just giving a teaching in our Dhammaloka Center in Perth the other day, and I was reading from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and one of the beautiful suttas about the Buddha, this is towards the very end of his life, is lying down between the famous twin sal trees. The sal trees are these magnificent trees in India, and he's lying down, he's on his deathbed, he's about to die, he's only, his death is only maybe an hour or two away, coming towards the very end. And then this man comes, this man called Subhadda, which means like the lucky one, the fortunate one, because it was very lucky, yeah? Subhadda, Badda means lucky or fortunate, Su is like very, very fortunate. So he comes and he says to Venerable Ananda, oh, I'd like to see the Buddha. And 
Where the Bible says, he's dying. What do you want to see him? He's lying there. He's just about to die. What, you can't ask this kind of question when he's dying. Yeah. Yeah, please, I want to see the Buddha. Shut up. Yeah. Go away. Yeah, this is not the right time. Uh, he this is just my exaggeration. Uh, he doesn't like to say that. But don't say these kind of things in the suttas. So, like, shut up. But, but, uh, <laughs> and then the Buddha overhears this conversation. And the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda, he says, uh, don't hinder this man, don't hinder this person. He's already a wanderer, a monk in a different tradition. Uh, he's coming with a sincere heart to ask a proper question about the practice. So here is the Buddha, he's about to die. It's, it's like literally almost straight before he dies, yeah? And then he takes on board this person and teaches him the Dhamma, and then he takes his last breath and dies. It's almost like that. Uh, it's a little bit in between, but not much. Uh, and of course, the beauty of that is that the whole purpose of the Buddha's life is to teach Dhamma. That's why he exists. He doesn't have any other purpose apart from teaching it. Everything he does is out of compassion, out of kindness for the world around him. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's such a wonderful example. So when you think about the Buddha like that, all he did, he lived his life for the compassion of other people, to be kind. He taught people through his very last breath to help them. And it is the same, almost, like with someone like Ajahn Brahm. I'm not really comparing Ajahn Brahm with the Buddha. I'm just saying that, you know, here is someone who's practicing in a similar kind of way. What a wonderful thing that is. Eh? When you think like that, that, we have these beautiful teachers in our life who have supported us in this way, these wonderful teachings, eh? it can give rise to a sense of gratitude eh? for having these things available to us. Eh? So gratitude is a very beautiful thing. Eh? And uh, the Buddha says in the Sutta, it's only Wise people usually have gratitude. So this is uh, another example, another example of how to have a bit of a, a to get some joy arising in your practice uh, is uh, to reflect on something in your life that you have done, uh, a time when you had a lot of spiritual happiness and joy, uh, yeah, when you did something that was particularly kind to somebody, maybe an act of generosity or, or whatever it was. Uh, and uh, you reflect back on that joy that you experienced at that time, uh, and then you can maybe bring it back into the present moment. Uh, we've all had times when we probably were very joyful because we did something pure, something very good-hearted, uh, and a bit out of that joy arose. Uh, and then we try to bring that back into our meditation by recollecting those acts of kindness and generosity. This is called, this is actually straight from the suttas, it's called Chaka Nusati, and uh, Sila Nusati, uh, the recollection of your past conduct and also your past generosity. This is another way of giving rise to that joy and happiness on the path. At other times, all you have to do is hang out with the breath and the joy and happiness comes automatically simply because you are practicing in the right way. Okay, I think I have talked way too much already, so for that reason I'm going to stop. And, uh, uh, I'm feeling a bit tired, to be honest. So let's just do some, <laughs> let's just do some meditation together, just to kind of chillax and just to uh, enjoy. And I may guide a little bit, see what I feel like, uh, and just to get started on this retreat uh, and uh, to see how things go. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
nice posture and where you are at ease and you are comfortable but the next thing is just to allow yourself to relax and so if you feel that you are bringing maybe some tiredness with you from the world outside and where you are not 100% relaxed and at ease and please spend all the time you need and to really find that relaxation inside and you want to let go of all the tension from the world all the stress from the world and leave all that behind and and the best way to do that is just to be patient, uh, to relax, to be kind to yourself uh, and allow these things to kind of fall uh, by the wayside, fall into the background, fall away uh, and then uh, uh, you should be on the right track. start out, remember that uh, one of the most important things initially is just to allow things to be and just to feel whatever it feels like to be here and just allow the thoughts to run around and uh, allow yourself to be tired and whatever it is. Uh, initially it's just the feeling of being present of being here, whatever that feels like that is the most important thing uh, because already by doing that much uh, you're letting go a little bit and you're stopping the controlling of the mind and just allowing life to unfold whatever it feels like. And then from that you start gradually to enjoy the peace.
you calm down a little bit as the world recedes into the background and see if you can feel that beautiful peace that is here and it's amazing that we are still in Hong Kong and it is so beautiful, it is so peaceful that the more you enjoy the peace, the more you enjoy this beautiful environment of the Kaduri Center and the more your mind inclines towards a meditation practice and there's something very beautiful about that peace and something that is far more subtle and far more profound than, than the ordinary uh, noise and business of the world. Uh, so incline your mind towards that uh, and then gradually things come together.
once again, make sure that you allow yourself to relax fully before you uh, watch the breath or do anything else. And it's so important to uh, get to that point where you just really enjoy yourself, just sitting there. You don't want to do anything else in the whole world but except sitting down and being peaceful. But there's something very attractive and beautiful about that. Uh, so just allow that to happen. Uh, allow yourself to enjoy the peace and to enjoy the good company and the good atmosphere. Uh, and if you enjoy these things, you also will be able to relax uh, because you can let go of the tensions uh, when you feel safe and you feel you are in a good place. Uh,
you enjoy the beautiful feeling of peace <coughs> and tranquility outside. Uh, invite, it, invite that peace into your mind, <coughs> mind and heart, uh, and allow it to <coughs> to spread inside of you, <coughs> to permeate your mind and permeate your heart. Uh, almost <coughs> as if you're taking this beautiful atmosphere and allowing it uh, inside you.
six o'clock or something and, and if you want to continue sitting there you're very welcome to come around <coughs> that time so we'll see you back again tomorrow morning let's do the Arana and Sama together <coughs>